Do it quietly. Alright. Hey guys, we're going to have a prayer to get started. And uh, then we're going to get back into Luke tonight. We're going to go all the way up to the crucifixion. We're going to look at the trial of Jesus this evening. And uh, looking forward to uh, spending a little time in the Word there. Um, do we have any, any pressing prayer requests? Things we haven't mentioned before? Yes, ma'am? Have a surgery on your elbow Friday. Unspoken. All right. Yes, ma'am. So we had to move our stores, and it's like really, really important that they do good. So we're opening up this week. Good stuff. All right. Yes, ma'am. Unspoken. All right. to us. 
Let's have our, our thoughts focused on the Word. God, we just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
all of their laws. No business was to be taken, uh, no business, no interrogation, none of that stuff would happen in the night. Everything was to happen the next morning. So as Jesus goes through the night, as he's being persecuted by these officers who are holding him and beating him and asking him, oh, you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. Remember that part that we talked about last time? As he's doing that, then in the middle of the night, there's a group that comes through and they start to ask him questions. And you can read about that one in Matthew and Mark. And they're, they're, they're trying to get Jesus to say things to trip him up. And Jesus is, is very quiet and he's saying all the right things in Matthew and Mark. And now we pick it up here in Luke and this is the, the second meeting of, of the group that's trying to bring an accusation against Jesus. Now this is the Jews. Now the Jews at this time were under, uh, were under, uh, they were under rule, all right, by two guys that we'll be introduced to in just a little bit. First Pilate, and then ultimately Herod. All right, we'll we'll look at them in just a second. But for an accusation to come against Jesus, it would have to first come from the Jews. But they really didn't have any authority. The Jews could not carry out any kind of sentencing. They couldn't uh, take Jesus' life from him, but they needed to bring some accusations. If they were going to turn him over to Pilate, and then Pilate eventually going to turn him over to Herod, as this kind of goes up the chain, they have to come up with something that he's done. Now, we see why they don't like it, because if you've been paying attention as we've gone all the way through Luke, Jesus was very direct, right? I mean, he was very direct with uh, with the, uh, the priests and the scribes and those high-up religious leaders, and really he challenged their authority. He challenged their standards. Where they thought they were righteous, Jesus said, you're not righteous. And so many times he called them out, uh, implying that they weren't truly believers, that they were just trying to live by their own man-made rules, and that they didn't really love or know God. So they hated him. They hated him. And they saw people beginning to follow him. So they wanted to do something. So they grab him in the garden. They bring him in. They have uh, officers beat him and mock him. They have this, uh, this phony trial that we're going to read about in just a second. One of them happens at night. This one here happens in the morning. And the whole question that they're going to ask, is they want to know, who does Jesus say he is? Now, that's the question we've been answering, isn't it? All the way through Luke, but that's the question we have been answering. And it is the most important question that you'll answer in your life. Who do you say that Jesus is? A.W. Tozer has a, a quote, the most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. What you think when you think about God. And it's the most important question because it determines not just the way that you act here and now, but it determines heaven and hell. And it determines eternity. And this is the question that they are asking. So starting in verse 66, let's, let's take off. And now that we're caught up, here's where we're at. It says, when day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Alright, so a, it, in this culture, in the Jewish culture, to claim to be God and not be God would have been punishable by death. This was a, a reasonable thing. This is what they wanted. They wanted to be able to make the accusation, this guy says he is God. 
And since they didn't believe he was God, then he would be uh, guilty of a death sentence. All right? and that would be his, his punishment. He would be guilty of making himself an idol to be worshipped. So that's what they're trying to establish. And they begin like this. They say very plainly, if you are the Christ, tell us. So they just they pull him in after he's been beat throughout the night. As after he's already gone through uh, one interrogation. And then they look at him and they say, if you're Christ, just, just say so. Just say so. They're wanting him to say yes. Because if he says yes, then they have an accusation to take uh, as they send him on down the line. All right? But how does he respond? He doesn't say yes. And there are those who, who have asked the question, why doesn't he just say yes? Because it wouldn't have been a lie, right? I mean, if he says, I am the Christ, that's right. That's exactly right. But as you see, Jesus speaks very vaguely in these terms. Uh, we see ultimately he's going to go to the cross. He knows that that's happening. He's very intentional in the things that he says. He said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. So the first thing that he points out is, why are you asking the question? Are you asking this question because you want to really know the answer? Or are you asking this question just to condemn it? If I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you, you're not going to say So he's, at, he's getting to the, to the root of why they've brought him up before them. All right? And he says this, But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So he makes this allusion, and he puts himself, when he says the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God, they would have understood that when he calls himself the Son of Man, uh, he's claiming to be God. Uh, when he puts himself at the right hand of the power of God, he's claiming to be not just the Son of Man, but he's claiming to be the Son of God. He's claiming to be deity. So when he says this, he says, you want me to answer plainly? Here's my answer. If I tell you, you won't believe. If I ask you, you won't confess. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly what the Bible prophesied about way back in Isaiah. And at this moment... But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So he makes this very definitive statement, but they want something clear. So here's what they say, verse 70. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Now, a great translation for this is, You are right in saying that I am. You are right in saying that I am. So he uses their words, and he says, you are right in saying that I am. And the reason we know that that's what he implied is because of the next verse. They say this. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. They took these words, and they understood it to be Jesus saying, he is God. The question that was asked way back in chapter 1, who is this Christ? Jesus has affirmed through his miracles. He has affirmed through his message. He has affirmed through his disciples. He has affirmed through other followers. He has affirmed here in this moment facing his death. If there was ever a moment where Jesus was going to back down from being God, this is it. If he was lying about it the whole time, people don't die for a lie. He would say, you know, we had a good run, but I'm not really God. That's not what I meant. We would have seen him backpedal, move away to save his own life. But he doesn't, does he? He affirms it. He claims to be God. So what happens then? He stands before him. They find him as guilty. This man says he is God. And the question today is, do you believe him? The question in that day was, do you believe him? Do you believe that this Jesus is God? 
you believe Jesus is God? And the answer that they offered was, no, we don't believe that. And we want him dead. We want no part of this Jesus. We do not believe he is who he says he is. And here's the truth, guys. That hasn't changed. In the 1960s, you had what they called the death of God movement. Which was the, the whole idea that now because of science, because of how intelligent man is, we no longer need the crutch that is God. So there were many publications, there were books that came out called The Death of God. And the idea is that now, since we don't need him anymore because we can explain some things on our own, we, we're going to do away with the whole idea that God ever existed. They were philosophically trying to kill God. That's the position of those who do not believe that Jesus is Lord. They don't want him around. They want him either figuratively or, in this case, physically dead. In other words, playing God. All right? So, what do they do? What do they do in this moment? All right? They have their accusation. This guy claims to be God. We don't think he is. We're all the religious leaders. So we believe he deserves death. The problem is, they can't make a death sentence. So what do they do? They have to take them, him to a guy by the name of Pilate. Now, Pilate is a, a regional uh, authority. He's over that area. They are under his rule and his reign. If he wants to give a death sentence, snap of his fingers. He gives a death sentence. But Pilate don't care anything about their Jewish traditions. It doesn't bother him if someone calls themselves the Jewish king of the world. He's not offended by that. So when the Jews come and they present him to Pilate, they have to come with something more than just, well, he says he's the Messiah. Because Pilate would look at him and go, so? What do I care? I'm not Jewish. I don't believe in this God anyway. So let's see what that looks like as they walk through. Starting in the very first verse of chapter 23. It says, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. All right? So now you see how the story changes, right? The question that they ask him is, do you think you're God? He affirms it. They, they see it clearly. They want him dead because of it. But when they take him to Pilate, what do they do? They flip the script. And they make it not a spiritual thing, but now they make it political. So if they're going to have him killed by these people whose rule that they are under, then how are they going to do it? Well, they're going to do it by accusing him of being against the king against the government trying to overthrow uh, the nation. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so, or you are right in saying so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this Place. So he looks at him, he says, are you the king of the Jews? He says, you've said so. And he looks back at the Jewish leaders and he says, this doesn't mean anything to me. This, this is not a big deal. I don't, I don't care if he's doing this, but they're, they're urgent. They set themselves against him and want him destroyed. So here's what they say. They say, yeah, but he's, he's stirring up the people. He is causing riots. He's causing this overthrow of our beliefs. He is a real <coughs> problem. Well, Pilate doesn't want a real problem on his hand, so he sends him on down the line to the next authority, passing him on. And so in verse 6 it says, When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod. So he begins to pass 
the buck. Pilate says, okay, well, that's, he's a Galilee. I'm going to send him over to Herod so he can be Herod's problem. All right, so now he's going to send him on. He says, I don't really want to be part of this. I don't want to make this call. This guy's not really guilty of anything that I can see. Uh, but, hey, these guys are being really insistent. I'm going to send him on over uh, to this Herod. And then it says this. When he learned he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So when they send him on to Herod, it's a little backstory here, uh, Pilate, Herod, did not get along. There was, these were not good buddies. These weren't co-workers. There was not collusion between them two. They didn't really like each other. Uh, through this story, they become friends. But uh, up until this point, uh, there were different rulers in different areas. And so now we have him, and he sends Jesus to Herod, which kind of excites Herod. Herod wants to hear from this Jesus. As a matter of fact, he kind of wants to see one of those sweet miracles that Jesus was doing as he went throughout his life. I mean, that's, this, is what's, this is what's going on here. So he pulls him in. And in verse 9, it says, So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. This had to be frustrating for Herod. He, he brings him in. He wants to talk with him. He wants to find out about Jesus. He wants to see maybe one of the signs or the miracles that Jesus has done. Uh, do you think that Jesus could have done a miracle right here? You think he could have shown Herod something pretty amazing? Herod would be like, I really like this guy. But maybe let's not kill him. I, mean, I think that would have been a reasonable thing. Jesus could have leaned into Herod and been like, listen, I'll turn that water into wine if you like. Do you like wine? Tell me what kind of wine you like. I'll make you some wine. And Herod would be like, I need this guy around. He can make me wine at any time. And he would not have killed him. There would have been an easy out here for Jesus, right? Herod is already, he's already drawn in. He wants to see a miracle. He's questioning Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? Nothing. He's not responding. He's definitely not doing a miracle. He's just being quiet. How frustrating do you think that was for Herod? Now, why do you think it was important that Herod be frustrated? Why do you think it's important? Because Herod was part of the plan to kill Jesus. All right, Jesus knew this. All right, so in verse 10, it says, The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. So the whole time, as he travels uh, from the Sanhedrin court all the way over to Pilate and then on to Herod, you got this group of accusers. What you do? Vehemently means adamantly or aggressively, passionately accusing him. All right? And so they're, they're standing and they are accusing this Jesus. They're following him to every court that he goes to. Is everybody staying with me? All right. They're following him to every court that he goes to. And they are accusing him wherever he goes. They have set themselves against him. And so now he's not saying anything. But the chief priests are making all of these accusations. And in verse 11 it says, And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this they had been at enmity with each other. So they were enemies. Now because of Jesus uh, they are brought together. Uh, really in their hatred for this problem. Alright? Jesus was a problem. He was messing with their uh, rule, their reign, their government in the same way that Jesus messes uh, with our rules and reigns and government. Alright? Jesus, for some, was a very direct problem. They had this absolute hatred for him. For others, he was an issue that they just didn't want to deal with. And then for even others... He was, there's someone that he wants to follow. They want to follow him with their whole life. I think you see a great picture of our world even today as you walk through these characters here. So in verse 13, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, 
You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people, and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. So after all of this, even infuriating Herod and Pilate, they still don't have anything to bring as capital punishment. There's no reason that, that Jesus should be killed. And Pilate says this. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. So here's what he says. Here's what I'm going to do. You guys don't like him? That's fine. I'll give him some lashes, and then I'll, I'll send him out. Now that's, that's about all that I'm comfortable doing, because he really hasn't done anything wrong. He doesn't even deserve that. I'll give him that just to make the people happy. Verse 18. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas. A choice was made in this moment. Who was Barabbas? The other Gospels tell us that Barabbas was a murderer and a thief. He was completely guilty to stand under the punishment of the cross. He deserved to be there. And they said, no, no, send Jesus. You think that's pretty fitting? That Barabbas, the one who deserved the cross, was released? And Jesus, the one who did it, was sent? Understand when we read this story, we tend to look at ourselves a lot of times as maybe Peter or John or one of the followers of Jesus or faithful. I think the best place to put ourselves in this story is in the place of Barabbas. Deserving of the cross. Deserving of the punishment. But what happens? Jesus takes our place. He steps in where we deserve because of our sins. We are set free, and he goes to the cross. We see the people demanded this. This was their hatred towards him. Verse 19, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release, release him. Now we see this, this pagan ruler mourning almost over Jesus. He says, there's no reason for this. This doesn't make sense. Where is this hatred coming from? And what is the response? Verse 23, but they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. Which means this. That as, as they were shouting their hatred toward God, eventually Pilate just looked at it and said, this is not worth the fight. Kill him. Take him. Can you imagine this type of, of hatred for a man? A man where, where even these, these pagan rulers could find no guilt, could find nothing wrong. But yet the religious despised him. So much so that they said, give us a murderer. Give us a thief. Understand that what they were doing when they traded Jesus for a murderer is they were saying, I want myself. That will be my God. I reject Jesus as God, and I want a murder, because understand, that's exactly what they were. In 
this moment as they scream, crucify him, don't you think that Matthew chapter 5 rings out where Jesus preached on the Sermon of the Mount? And he says, you've heard it said of those of old, do not kill, but I say to you, anyone who hates his brother, anyone who says, Raka, or you fool, will be guilty of judgment. Don't you think Jesus' words, as, as they scream their hatred towards them, where he parallels hatred and murder, don't you think that those rang true in this moment? Verse 24, so Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Now I want us to understand something here. There was no power in Pilate delivering Jesus to the will of the people. If at any point, if at any point, Jesus didn't want this, wasn't surrendering himself, he had a way out. There's an old song that says he could have called 10,000 angels. Anybody ever heard the song? He could have called 10,000 angels. Do you believe that? Yes. yes. Sure he could. Sure. Do you think that Pilate had power over Jesus? No. Did Herod have power over Jesus? Did the Sanhedrin court have power over Jesus? Isn't it funny to watch this play out as Jesus submits himself and to watch men who think they have authority over God deciding what happens? This delusion that they have. And all throughout this, we watch Jesus alone submitting and surrendering himself to the hatred of man, the very men that he's going to the cross to die for. As he watches this mockery of a trial unfold, where at any moment in this, all he has to do is say, put a few words, and it goes away. Don't you think that he went back to the garden and that prayer where he sits there before the Father, and he says this, not my will, but your will be done. And we see God's will be done even in these pagan men who hate God. He's using them for His glory and for His purpose, which is the cross. So understand, as we see the accusations against Jesus, we see Him willingly and all by Himself in the power of His Father, of the, and the power of God, submitting Himself humbly to the crucifixion. Next week, we're going to walk with Jesus on the road to Golgotha, on the road to the cross. We're going to see him surrender his life.